always, I was sort of a 19th century engineer in the sense that uh, in the 19th century, engineering was a very different enterprise than it is today, particularly major project engineering. If you took someone like Eiffel of Eiffel's Tower fame or Roebling who did the Brooklyn Bridge, these were people who stood, each one, at the pinnacle of a pyramid of designers and engineers and technicians and draftsmen. But there was nobody in that pyramid whose job they couldn't do. That's not today's world. In today's world, you have a project manager who can't do the jobs of anybody that he is directing. Uh, and the net result is, if I were to go to work for an automobile company, I would have spent the rest of my life designing doorknobs and taillights. And uh, I wanted to be able to take a concept, turn it into a product, and then create that product, documentation, prototype parts, uh, put it all together myself, put it in a package which I had designed, and see it go out the door. That's about the nearest thing that uh, anyone could get to playing God. You start with nothing and there it is, a product at the end. You can't do that in normal engineering in the 20th century and that's what I wanted to do. So I always went to work for small companies. Somebody, uh, a company that, that couldn't afford to have all these different departments. They needed somebody who could wear six hats. And that was me and that's the direction that I took and thoroughly enjoyed it. In addition to which, of course, what am I going to apply my skills and ability to but gaming machines? Okay, where the hell did that all come from? And as, believe it or not, it started very early in life. I think I must have been about eight or nine years old. I was living in Cleveland at the time, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, it was the war years. Uh, there was a place across the street from where I lived, a kind of little store. And at the back of the store, they had a porch, and on the porch was a slot machine. And I just had to play that machine. Well, dimes were kind of scarce, but I finally got hold of one, and that was it. I went there. Looked around, nobody was there, put the dime in the machine and pulled the handle. And three bills came up, which paid 18 coins. And out came 10 coins and eight red points. Now you're wondering what the hell a red point is. In the war years, everything was rationed. From socks to butter to sugar to tires, no matter what it was, it was rationed. And everybody had a ration book. And you had the little tickets in the ration book that enabled you to buy a certain number, a quantity of these particular items. And uh, the quantity was on the ticket. And if what you were buying required fewer points than was registered on the ticket, they gave you your change in the form of these little fiberboard tokens the size of a dime. Uh, and they were called red points. I'm sorry, uh, uh, these were blue points because they were the uh, uh, ration tokens for everything except meat. Uh, meat was a very, very scarce commodity. You couldn't get a hamburger without red points, okay? And uh, the interesting thing was you'd go into a restaurant and every, every restaurant had a special blue plate special uh, and that did not require red points. It was a meat dish that did not require red points. But whether it was fried or stewed or baked, whatever it was, it was always the same. Spam. <laughs> okay. But uh, at any rate, these were the red points that came out of the machine. <laughs> I'm wondering, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> these red points. But uh, it was the machine itself, I think the fact that I had hit a winner on the machine is the trigger that started the rest of my interest in, in, in this uh, machine. Um, at any rate, that was the start of it. As
time went on, I became more and more fascinated with uh, gaming machines, particularly because there were always these uh, matchbooks around that said Herald's Club in Reno and advertisements for Herald's Club in Reno. And here's this place and rooms full of uh, not only slot machines, but another passion of mine. Uh, Herald's Club uh, was about a three-story casino enterprise. And the guy was a collector of antique weapons. And the walls in that casino, all three floors, were covered with antique weapons of every kind. And he even had a Gatling gun. And it was so famous, this particular enterprise, that Life magazine had done a 10-page photo spread on Harold's Club. Uh, there were uh, buggies and wagons hanging from the ceilings in this place. Uh, I finally, later on in life, went to Harold's Club. I was actually there and I was playing the machines. And the second great hit came about. I was playing a four-reel mechanical slot machine. And uh, I'd gone through a roll of nickels and about another half roll, and I was about ready to quit the machine. And out came four symbols on the pay line. Oh, I've hit a jackpot, isn't that nice? Uh, how much does that pay? And I was wondering, because the bells were going off and the lights were flashing, I mean, it must have been something significant. And I suddenly realized that this was a metered machine. On top of the machine, there were two meters, number meters. And the numbers advanced. On every third pull of the handle, the number on a meter would advance. On the next third pull, the other meter would advance. And there was an arrow, red arrow, that lit up on either one or the other. And I thought to myself, hey, that can't be it. That's it would be a five-coin machine. No, wait a minute, this isn't a five-coin machine, it's a one-coin machine. I hit the biggie. $3,700 <laughs> was lit up. <laughs> okay, anyway, that was that cinched it for me. I was uh, a passionate follower of gaming machines from then on.